Welcome to Father's Heart. It's such a great <clears throat> privilege and honor to be with you again tonight. And uh, I'm trusting God that tonight we will be able to go through His Word and be able to study His Word. And I believe it's going to be life-changing for every single one of us. I believe that God's Word is always powerful and mighty. Sharper than any two-edged sword will always go out and it <clears throat> will always accomplish that which is set out to do without failure. So therefore, we can trust God and believe God that as His Word goes forth, it will actually fall on fertile ground Take root, grow, develop, bear forth much fruit, and bring change upon the lives of the individuals that it encounters. So tonight I've titled the topic tonight, uh, Transformation. And I believe that is something that you and I need to embrace, is the transformation and the change that happens in our lives because of the involvement of the Holy Ghost and because of the involvement of Christ in our lives. So as people are busy signing on and getting ready to, to, to join us tonight, let's just commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to be able to share your word once again. Father, we never take these opportunities for granted, nor do we take them lightly, because we know there are places in this world, Father God, where your word is restrained and held back. But Father God, we thank you tonight that we still have the freedom and the liberty to, to be able to share your word. And I pray that continues, Father God, and you give us the liberty and the freedom to be able to share your word wherever we go, without... Father God, any limitations or, or restraints in Jesus' name. So, Father God, we also thank you tonight that every individual that hears this message, Father God, will be impacted. And I pray that they will go through a place of transformation, Lord, and come into a place where they can grow and become strong in the things of the Lord. We therefore give you all the glory, honor, and praise for everything that will be accomplished tonight in Jesus' mighty and precious name. And everybody said, Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God, so many more coming online, that's, that's encouraging, and we're just trusting God that, I'm, you know, it's difficult on that side of this camera, who knows what's going on, and uh, we always have to trust God when we minister to this camera that um, things are happening out there, and that is true, and because we believe God's words powerful cannot return void, and therefore it accomplishes that which is doing on the other side of this camera. Tonight, as I said, I want to speak about transformation, by the way, for those that do not know me, I'm Pastor Leslie Hissel, and I'm going to be with you for the next 30 minutes or so. As we expound God's word and spend time in his word and just learn a little bit more about what his word is all about. As I said, the topic tonight, transformation. And I want to start off by basically reading to you Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Very well known passage of scripture. A well known verse that says this, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. There's the inspiration by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know what, when Jesus, when you look at the life of Jesus, uh, many people that says that he's a servant leader, and he is. The Bible does teach us that he's come to serve and that his whole ministry was that of servant to the body of Christ. He subjected himself to them. And therefore, um, as he did uh, subject himself to the body of Christ, to, the, uh, to us, um, he came to serve. And, and, and we understand that, but to me, that is, that is part of the picture. That's not the complete picture because part of um, Jesus' other leadership trait is that he was a transformational leader. In other words, you know, anything and everybody and any, anyhow that he encounters, there's a, there was a change that came. There was a transformation that came. And you and I might as well embrace that. We might as well grab that and say, Lord, change me, mold me, make me into what you want me to be. Let me transform. Let me be different. And the whole process of sanctification of the body of Christ and working out your own salvation, all that talks about a transformation and a change. It talks that your life cannot be the same tomorrow as it was today. If you've got 10 years down the road or even five years or maybe even two years down the road, you should notice change that actually happens in your life. Because if you have not evolved or transformed into the image of Christ and more like him every single day in, in your conduct, in, your, in the way that you live, your values, your morals, your character, everything, then I believe you partly missing the boat. Um, because it, it has to do with your life becoming more like Christ every single moment of every single day. Is that the sole focus? No, it's not. Because God also at the same time expects you and I to encounter Him and to encounter this world and to be an instrument of change to this world. So you and I need to spread the gospel, speak the good news, uh, paint the picture of Jesus to this lost and dying world so they can come into a relationship with Christ themselves and that they can start being transformed and changed as well. So this transformation factor <coughs> is critical in the life of a believer. And it's something that you and I have to embrace and walk through. Change is there to stay. Okay, We're going to grow into the image of Christ until the day comes that we are going to come face to face with Him. 
and then we will be changed in the twinkling of an eye and we'll be given a glorified body. And I believe at that point, there's going to be a fast tracking in many people's lives where the last little bit of work is going to be done. But many of us here on earth, the quicker you can actually start transforming and changing into his image, the better for you. So if we look then at this verse that we've just read, which I say is a, it's a well-known uh, verse, it says this, and do not be conformed to this world. So that's the first instruction we have, is that, listen, now that you come into a relationship with Christ, you can no longer live by the standards of this world, okay? Because you're, 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 you have now gone into, you know, been transferred, translated from one world into another. You've been taken from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. So therefore, there's been a, a, a movement, okay? And therefore, the kingdom that you are a part of now is the kingdom of God, no longer the kingdom of darkness, no longer the kingdom of, of the devil, okay? So therefore, because you're coming across into the kingdom of light, into the kingdom of God, you cannot be conformed to this world that you are still living in. Because you and I live in this world day to day, and you cannot be conformed to it. You cannot live according to its standards, because its standards are no longer applicable to you, because you now have a new standard, which is basically documented in the Bible, and you and I need to pursue that and get to know that. So what, is, what, is the, what does Paul tell the Roman church here then? He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. You must be changed. Okay? And as I said, transformation is critical in the life of, of, of Christians. How must the transformation take place? By the renewing of your mind. Okay, so your mind needs to change, and it needs to change the way it thinks, and you can't, because the Bible says that His ways are not our ways, okay? His thoughts are not our thoughts. So therefore, we don't think the way that God thinks. We don't move and conduct ourselves the way God does, and therefore we need to change. We need to transform. We need to go from point A to point B and be more like more like God and be like God ultimately. Um, and that is what we are, are, are working towards and that's what we want to achieve. So he says then that you need to renew your mind. So the mind of the, the mind needs to be renewed. Now do you do you and I do that on our own all the time? No, we do it with the assistance of the Holy Ghost. Because as we uh, partake of the word and start studying the word and learning the word and listening to the voice of the Lord and walk under the unction and direction of the Holy Spirit, you will find that that change starts happening naturally and normally. So the Holy Spirit will come and he will start changing the way you think and ultimately change your conduct and change the way that you live your life. So we need to just surrender to God to allow that to happen. That you may prove, why is all this necessary? So that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So in other words, at the end of the day, it's all about the will of God. And we need to prove it. We need to, um, um, that it's good, it's acceptable, and it's, it's perfect. Okay, so that, that is, that is the, what we're trying to, to, to um, show or f through our life, throughout what we do. So that is the bottom line. That's what we need to do. So we need to prove that and therefore we cannot conform to this world and we have to change and produce godly fruit in our lives. So Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 27 then, key verse, it says, For he, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. So the way I think is ultimately going to manifest in who I am. So if I think negative bad thoughts about myself all the time, I'm going to become insecure, I'm going to become double-minded, I'm going to have all those kinds of things happening. But if I think the way God thinks, I'm blessed, I'm walking God's will, I'm... I'm, I'm um, I'm walking in perfect health. I think that he's got a plan for my life and I've entered into that plan. And, and you start speaking the word of God over your life and conduct of your life. You will start seeing that manifest. Okay. Our mind is where seed is planted. Our mind is where everything starts. Our mind is where the, the seed bed of everything we experience and that we have in our lives. Okay. Because ultimately your thoughts are going to basically go into a it's going to fill your mouth with speech. You're going to start speaking about what you're thinking about. And as you do that, you're going to start manifesting that. People will grab that and obviously ultimately can make your, your thoughts uh, manifest in reality. Give you an example that if, if I want to make something or build something, like even an architect that's 
making a house, what he does first and foremost is he, he basically conceptualizes it. He starts thinking and dreaming based on, on what he believes the people want and what they're going to get, going to get. So he'll conceptualize and dream and think about it. Then he'll start documenting it. He'll make drawings and, uh, basically present those to the people that are concerned and say, listen, is this what you want? And then that will get done. So he goes from his thoughts into words. He starts describing it. He starts speaking about it. And then once he does that, then ultimately he starts communicating to the builders and construction companies as to how to build and what to do with the drawings and everything else he's made. And then the end result is that you have a building or a house that will basically be uh, linked to the original thoughts of the creator of that house. So you can see the whole process that goes through there. It starts with a thought. It basically gets documented and, and, and you know, write the vision cleanly and plainly and, and, and clearly. Um, once that is done, then it starts kind of verbalizing it and speaking and describing it to communicate it to others. And therefore you're describing it and showing your vision to others and communicating it accurately and properly. And then they will grab your vision, they'll run with it, and ultimately you'll see that they start putting action to the words and you have the manifestation of the vision. So that has never changed. That is still there today as it ever was from day one. Okay, so we understand that the mind is there for the seedbed. It's the ground in which those first thoughts get planted and we originate everything from the mind. That's why the Bible says that the transformation starts by renewing your mind. You have to start renewing your mind and the way you think to be able to kick off the transformation process in your life. If you don't change your thinking, then you're not going to, the transformation is not going to be successful and therefore you are what you think. Okay, and your thought life influences your daily conduct and what you are and who you are and how you manifest. So we've got to keep that very much in mind. All right. So, so anything that is not of God or godly needs to be taken captive and cast down. So you can't therefore entertain thoughts that are not of God. We see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, verse 5. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity and obedience and the obedience of Christ. So the battleground where the devil is going to really take you on is your mind. Okay, that is his battleground. If he can affect your thought life, and that's why you get thoughts interjected into your mind, you think, where the heck did that thought come from? Okay, and many things initiate thoughts in your mind. You know, things that you read in on a billboard, um, news articles, magazines, newspapers, uh, things people say, uh, uh, things that you see. I mean, and then the list goes on and on and on. Everything has the ability to basically originate a thought in your mind. What you do with the thoughts is what's critical and important because those thoughts that are not godly or doesn't lift up the things of the Lord and doesn't glorify God, those thoughts you need to take captive, cast them down and totally get them out of your life. But if the thought is wholesome, true, and it's edifying and uplifts and all this kind of stuff, Philippians 4.8 tells me that we can think about those things. But don't think about things that do not lift up and exalt God and make God big or is a godly in nature. So therefore, we, we have to look at that because the devil is going to put all kinds of, of thoughts in your life. That's where um, lust comes from. That's where um, jealousy and pride and all those things come from because he will compare you to the Smiths and to the Joneses and to whoever else. And he's going to say, oh, but look what they've got and look what you've got. And, and, and that whole thing comes into, into being in your life. And when that starts happening and you start dwelling on those and thinking about that, then that is when we have a challenge. That's when we've got a problem because now your thoughts are no longer in line with God's word or godly in nature, and therefore you're not going to you're going to you're going to reap the fruit of those of those thoughts at the end of the day. So you should be thinking then on all of the good things that are, you find in Philippians four eight. Now in Ephesians chapter four and verse twenty three, there's also a, a interesting thought there because this talks about the spirit of your mind. And it said, and be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh mental and spiritual attitude. That's the Amplified Classic. So, Romans 12, 2 was talking about transformation. How? By the renewing of your mind. Okay, so there's a transformation that takes place. Yeah, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 23, it says, and be constantly Renew, uh, constantly renewed, not just a once of exercise. Ooh, yeah, I mean, if it was a once of exercise, that would have been great. We could have done it, got rid of it, and then carried on. No, 
It's a constant thing. It's the thing that's continual. It's the thing that does not stop. So the devil, while he is here on this planet, he is going to try and kill you, and he's going to try and steal from you, and he's going to try and destroy you. You've got to remember that. You've got to keep that foremost in your mind, because the thing is that he is walking around like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. So his purpose is to come to try and kill, steal, and destroy, to devour you and take you out. Jesus came that you might have life and life more abundantly. Jesus came to destroy the works of the evil one. So therefore, Jesus already has done that. We just have to enforce it. Okay, because Jesus, the judgment that has been passed on Satan is a complete judgment, but the, 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 the implementation thereof is partial. Because the thing is that the devil is still here on this earth. Okay, and we have authority over him. That's why the, Jesus has already done a complete work. You have the authority. You can rule and reign in this life because of the authority that Jesus has given us. But at the end of the day, the devil is still here. And he's only going to be taken out when Jesus uh, passes final judgment uh, and he gets cast into the lake of fire. So when that happens, then evil will be removed from this earth once and for all. And that will be it. Okay, but up until that point, we still have to contend with the influences of the devil, and we've got to contend with him trying to kill, steal, and destroy while he's still the god of this world. So he thinks he's still got uh, rulership over this, and he does have rulership over those that do not accept Christ. But the ones that have accepted Christ, we have been trans uh, translated, we have been moved, we have moved from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, and you've got to remember that, and you've got to understand that. So as you embrace that, and you pull that in, and you make that part of your life, you will walk victorious before God. And you will be able to see the change. And I believe without a shadow of a doubt that God is looking for a generation of people at this point that are unshakable in their faith, that can stand firm in their faith, just like God is himself. God is unshakable. God cannot be moved. God's word is yea and amen. It's, it's a, you can trust it. God will never change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you need to come into that place that you are so solid in your faith, you're so rock fast in your faith and your confidence in God that you cannot be shaken. You become unshakable yourself. And God is looking for a people that will be able to go forward in the things of God and not be shaken by this world. You know, the storms of the world come, tossed to and fro, the book of James says, unstable in all your ways. No, <coughs> God wants you and I, excuse me, to be single-minded in our focus, to be like flint, focused. And not be able to be moved either way, whichever way the devil wants to try and move you. Because when the storm comes, you walk on the water. Not, you don't, you're not, you're not cast to, you're not cast down by that storm. And Jesus wants you not to be able to, to walk through that storm without that storm even having any impact or effect on you. If you walk through the fire, remember the story of Daniel and his three friends that went into the fiery furnace. And when they went in there, when they came out, they didn't even smell of smoke. But the thing is that we need to understand that God wants us to go. We'll, we, he's never promised that we will not go through a storm. Let me put it that way. He's never promised that we will not go through a storm. And as part of the transformation exercise, we need to get our faith in action and faith in place so that we are able to walk through these storms and not even have the smell of smoke on us when we come out the other side. The challenge should not affect you and I at all. So the mind is therefore critical. In, in, in the way that we, that we transform and the way that we change. All right. So the mind is a starting point. It's the seedbed upon which thoughts are, are, are planted. And those thoughts ultimately affect who you are and what you are. And the devil knows that. And therefore he's going to try and trip you up in your thought life. He's going to try and trip you up in your, in your mind. That's where he's going to battle you because he knows that's where you're weak. That's where if he can grab any dream or vision, when it's still young and small, he can cancel it out. But once it manifests and starts happening, then then he then his uh, chances of destroying or derailing is extremely small. But while you're still conceptualizing and thinking about it, if he can put thoughts and stuff in there that can trip you, then then he's going to and he's going to try and and take that out and make that uh, not work in your life. So for you and I then to transform. There has to be a complete change. You cannot be the same person. Because remember, in the book of Corinthians, the Bible says, when you're born again, you're a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, everything has become brand new. So already there, there's a transformation. 
old things have passed away. Behold, everything is going to come brand new. So therefore, as everything's come brand new, your sin, your past, everything is, that was there before has been removed, taken away. It's no longer there. And therefore, God has given you a clean slate. He's now giving you opportunity to move forward. It's a devil that comes and reminds you of your past. You now have to remind him of his future. Okay. So, so you need to remember that all things have passed away. Behold, everything has come brand new. And that transformation takes place in the lives of, of people. So with that transformation, then there has to be a complete change. It cannot just be a partial change. It cannot just be a little bit of a change. It has to be day and night. You have to go from the old man to the new man. And so when you transform, we know that that, that that change comes about us. And one of the first things that you and I have to do is to strive towards being like God. All right. Now, that's not an arrogant term. That's not whatever. That is because we have to comply to Him. Okay, and everything he teaches us. So, so First Peter chapter one and verse thirteen through sixteen says this. So brace your minds. There you see this word mind come up again. Amplify classic version. So brace up your minds. Be sober. Set your hope wholly and unchangeably on grace. Remember grace, divine favor. That is coming to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. Live as children of obedience to God. There we need to be obey. Do not be conformed. There we see the conform. We saw in Romans 12 too. Your souls to the evil desires. That's the world. That governed you in the former ignorance. We did not know the requirements of the gospel. But as the one who called you is holy. Again, this is the part I want to get to. But as the one who is called, who called you is holy. You yourself also be holy in all your conduct and manner of living. For it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. There is the standard. God expects you and I to target and to aim for that standard. So in the transformation then that we go through, which starts with your mind and your thinking, your goal is to ultimately become like God to be holy even as he is holy that is the standard that he has set that is the standard that you and I aim for all right so we want to be holy even as he is holy all right so we have to have in our conduct we'll see there yeah it's our conduct it is the way we we live our life we need to be in, in, in obedience to him and make sure that we comply to that standard then we see in Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, it says this, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. There you see the conforming to his image of his Son again. So we need to be like him, that he might be firstborn among many brethren, which Christ is. He is the firstborn among many brethren. You and I are the brethren that followed after him. Then we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, But we all... With unveiled, unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. There you see the transformation again. Into the same image, from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. In other words, the Spirit of the Lord does a work in us to make us comply and come into the image of God, being transformed and made into that image, being the same as Christ from glory to glory. And then we see in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it is not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. So that's why I said to you, there's gonna, we're going to be, everybody's going to be on a different position on the growth path towards being like Christ. But the second that Christ comes back and the church gets caught up to be with Him, that second we will all come to a place um, to be like Him, and we shall we will be totally and completely, the job will be done. Okay, there'll be, for some people it'll be, a, some people will be, you know, you know what I mean. So, so people will change and come into the complete image when we, when Christ comes. So, so the, that, that I believe will only happen when we see God, Christ. I don't believe that we will, while we're here on earth, <clears throat> there'll be too much, there's too much sin and too much imperfection still around us, that we will be able to come to the fullness of Christ. Christ is the only one that's ever been able to live to that standard. And so therefore, that's why he was the perfect lamb without spot or wrinkle. So so the thing is that he, he had that standard. So we're all growing towards that. I don't believe we'll achieve that 
until we actually see him face to face. All right. That's Les's opinion. Okay. So for us then to see the renewing of our mind and for our minds to come in line with, with the word of God, just to bring that transformation, to make it real in the believer's life, in your and my life, to see that transformation start happening. There's a couple of practical things that need to, need to happen in our lives. The first thing is we must be intentional. We must intentionally want to renew our minds, intentionally. We cannot just think it's going to happen, you know, whichever way. No, it must be intentional. How do you do, how do you do that? We saw that with taking thoughts captives, 2 Corinthians. Take those thoughts captives, cast them down if they do not um, exalt Christ, if they come up against Christ. We need to meditate on the word, Joshua 1, 8, Psalm 1, 2. We need to, need to meditate on that word. We need to allow that word to become part of us, be in us, and to work through us because the word itself is powerful and living and it will do the job within us as we allow that word entrance. That becomes revelation knowledge because Romans 10, 17, but faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So as we allow that word entrance, the word will do the work with the assistance of the Holy Spirit. And then we need to set our minds on the things above. That is a basically a decision. That word set means that you've got to take your mind and focus it there. And if it doesn't want to focus there, you force it to focus there, as far as I'm concerned. All right. So it says in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2, and set your minds and keep them set. That's why I said, you know, I, I get this picture in my mind of taking a person's head and turning it towards it and say, Watch there, set your mind on it, and then you hold it there. You don't allow it to change. You will look at it. Okay. So it's that kind of thinking. It says, and set your minds and keep them set on what is above, the higher things, not on the things that are on the earth. So therefore, do not allow your mind to be, be tarnished and influenced by the things that are going on here. You've got to keep your mind set on the things of the Lord. Focus on what is, what, what is uh, on Him and everything related to Him, and you'll see the change start happening. So there's some practical things that you need to be intentional. Take thoughts captive, meditate on the word, set your mind. Okay, so those things are things that need to need to happen. Okay, then we need to replace carnal earthly thinking with godly thinking. Okay, so how do you do that? You've got to agree with God. That's the first thing you've got to do. So when you read the word, don't just read it ver uh, um, mechanically. Okay, meditate on it. Allow it to become part of you. Job 21 and verse uh, 22 verse 21 says, Acquaint now yourself with him, agree with God, and show yourself to be conformed to his will, and be at peace. By that you shall prosper, and great, great good shall come to you. So, so we need to then make this decision that when we read something, yes, I agree with that. I agree that greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I agree that I'm more than a conqueror through Christ who strengthens me. I agree that no weapon formed against me can prosper. I agree that it, in my hands touch will prosper in Jesus' name. And, and you, you, you carry on. I'm blessed of God. I walk in a provision of God. I thank you, Lord, that you have blessed me in every spiritual, with every spiritual blessing. And so you continue and so you go on. So be spiritually minded and not carnally or earthly minded. We also see that in Romans 8 verse 5. It says, for those who are according to the flesh are controlled by its unholy desires, set their minds on and pursue those things which uh, gratify the flesh. But those who are according to the spirit and are controlled by the desire of the spirit, they you see set their minds again, set their minds on and seek those things which, are grat which gratify the Holy Spirit. Okay, so set your mind again on those things. Set your mind, decide, make a decision. To be spiritually minded, not carnally minded. I'm not going to be earthly minded. I'm not going to be influenced by what I see with my natural eyes and ears and whatever else. I'm going to be influenced by what God's word says. God's word, take, word, God's word takes preeminence in my life. It's number one. It's a, I will follow that and I'll honor that word. And then we need to let the word dwell in us. Okay, That a lot of people don't like doing. That I mean memorize scripture. Okay, let the word dwell in you. Let that word become part of you. You have to allow that word to grow through you. So you need to know the word. You need to be able to at least quote some scriptures. Okay, and the more the better. Right, so let it for take your scripture a week. Memorize it. Bring it into your spirit. Have it there and then repeat it and allow it to work into your heart. Okay, and then pray that the Holy Spirit helps you to protect your mind. Because... In Proverbs 4, verse 23, it says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. It is critical that we protect and guard our heart. Now, 
the protection that I'm referring to is to not allow the devil to throw all kinds of thoughts into your mind. So therefore, the things you see, the things you read, the things you're exposed to, all right, you can ask the Holy Spirit to help you to protect your mind, to make sure that what comes into your mind is, is filtered through the Holy Spirit. And he will convict you and show you if, it, if, you, if you're involved or looking at stuff that's not of God, not godly, convict you and work on you to stop doing that and to, to get out of it. And then if it becomes a bad habit, then to say, Lord, help me break this habit or whatever the case would be. So ask the Holy Spirit to help you to protect your mind. Recognize where the evil, wrong and destructive thoughts originate from and resist them. So in other words, when those things come in, recognize it. Recognize where it's coming from. Okay, um, It could be through the internet. It could be um, a certain friend or person that that you know that basically lives a whichever life and they you might have to basically bring that friendship to an end and say, I can't continue being your friend, um, uh, whatever the case may be. Because in James 4, 7, it says, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So you've got to identify the sources, resist them, okay, get rid of them. Okay, know that there's no condemnation to them who are in Christ. Okay, we know that from Romans 8 verse 1. So therefore, there's no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. We need to understand that we walk free. We have the peace of God. His kingdom is a kingdom of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So in His kingdom, there's peace. There is no condemnation. You're not condemned about anything before God. God has paid the price for all sin to be dealt with. So sin is no longer the issue. It's unbelief in what God has done that's the issue because it's unbelief that's going to keep you out of heaven and not sin. And then... Know who you are in Christ, okay? You are perfectly made. Psalm 139 verse 13 and 14 says this, For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. So God, you've done a perfect job in me. And I thank you that you are busy leading me and guiding me into that place that you've made me you said be perfect even as i am perfect and therefore father i thank you because i am perfectly made you are working a work in my life and so therefore be transformed into the image of christ the world needs you until next time may the lord bless you